Hey, this is Frank Taylor coming to you from my backyard, and this is the May episode of Nature in Your Backyard. And today I'm going to talk about salamanders. I love salamanders. I think they're the coolest little animals that that you can find, and they're really cool because you can find them. And after you watch this show, you know something you may want to do uh, is go out and take a look and see if you can find some. And I'm not just in my backyard. I'm in the salamander capital of the world. That's what some people call the Southern Appalachians. And in the state of Virginia alone, we have 50 different species of salamanders. And there's nowhere else in the world that has so many. The Smithsonian Institute of Conservation says that we have the greatest salamander diversity of anywhere in the world. So it's a really cool place to be. So salamanders are amphibians. And we've talked already about amphibians. We saw we talked about the green frog and we talked about the newts. And you can check out those videos on my YouTube channel if you haven't seen them yet. But uh, uh, today we're going to look at a, another species of salamander that I just happened to cross when I turned over a log near my house. These um, uh, salamanders, amphibians, we usually think of them as being uh, uh, partly aquatic. Part of their life is in the water, part of their life is on land. That's pretty much what a, you know, we, we interpret being an amphibian is. But some amphibians, some salamanders, are 100% aquatic. Like there's a salamander called the hellbender that gets really big and you can find in southern Virginia, um, and it spends its whole life in the water. Then there's an American newt. We talked about that one, where eggs are laid in the water, and it has a complex lifestyle where, where part of a life is on land. Well, the salamander species I'm going to talk about today is completely terrestrial. That means he lives on land the whole, his whole life. And they've adapted to do that by laying their eggs in moist places under rocks. And essentially, the larvae go through their gilled aquatic stage inside that egg. So let's take a look at the slimy salamander, our guest episode today. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. And here's to make this invasive. It's exotic. Dogwoods are flower. And I just took a couple swipes terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's so here's our featured guest for the day. This is the northern slimy salamander. And you can see that he has a, a very dark colored body, almost blue black. He has big eyes um, and a kind of round tail, um, and he wants to escape. Um, I wet my hand uh, with this jar of water here before I picked him up. Um, it's probably a good practice uh, with salamanders uh, because um, they need to keep their skin moist. And if your hands are very, very dry and you pick one up, um, that could potentially disturb um, his, his balance. Um, slimy salamanders are lungless salamanders. Um, so this guy has to breathe through his skin. And if his skin dries, he's just not going to be able to do that. So uh, this is a group of lungless salamanders. Interesting to see how many toes he has. Check out those little feet there. And... Uh, He's looking around, checking out the environment. Slimy salamanders, like uh, other salamander species, um, are usually hidden during the day. And I think that, again, ties uh, both to reducing the risk of predation, but also because of their dry skin and their exposure to sunlight um, uh, and dry air during the day and heat wouldn't be favorable to them. So uh, they tend to be active at night where they go hunting. And uh, if you want to find salamanders, a really good time to find them is on rainy evenings that salamanders will uh, walk across the floor, forest floor on, on 
rainy uh, nights looking for food. What does a guy like this eat? Well, he'll eat earthworms, slugs, snails, centipedes, millipedes, any little invertebrates that he can find on the forest floor. So while handling a salamander, I always try to keep my hands moist, right? Um, it's good uh, uh, to help protect them and not disturb their delicate skin, which they have to breathe through and cause it to dry out. Um, when I get a salamander, <clears throat> I'll keep him for a few days if I'm going to show him on my, uh, my program. And I usually get a little container like this and put some moss and some sticks and some leaf debris in there and they were good to keep uh for a few days um i don't recommend uh keeping them for a long time uh because they're very difficult to feed because you would have to provide them with earthworms centipedes millipedes snails slugs uh, of a size that uh, they could consume so it's not really easy to to feed them but it's a it's fun to find them uh check them out keep them for a couple days and then always release exactly back to where you found them and always put back any rock or board or log that you turn over looking for them, put them back in the same way. And again, great time to look for them is on rainy evenings. Go out with your flashlight uh, and walk uh, across the forest floor and uh, you may run into some walking around at night. They're very nocturnal. They like damp rainy nights to go out and hunt. So slimy salamanders, um, to uh, protect themselves, will release a glue-like slime that probably gets into the jaws of, the, of their predators and tastes bad and is probably toxic. So that's one way to protect. But another thing that uh, some salamanders and lizards may do is they will, um, <clears throat> when threatened by a predator, and they think their risk getting eaten, they'll let their tail break off. Um, and they have some kind of mechanism to do that. And that tail will wiggle and flop around while the rest of the salamander um, escapes and hides. And I think this may have happened to this particular salamander because um, its tail looks very much shorter than the tail of the other salamander I have and kind of ends in a nub there rather than um, smoothing out to a long point. So I think this salamander may have done that um, predatory escape mechanism and had its tail break off. Isn't that amazing that they can do that? Ecologically, it's a very expensive thing to do for the animal to lose a part of its body and then have to spend a long time eating to, to grow it back. But um, an amazing, amazing survival strategy. Well, I hope you enjoyed our episode on slimy salamanders today. I just put my salamanders uh, back in their little terrarium. I have some moss and some water. And this afternoon, I'm going to take them. I'm going to put them back right at the same log where I found them a few days ago. It's always a good practice. And before I picked up my phone again, I went inside and washed my hands with soap and water. Uh, slimy salamander in particular got its name because it releases that uh, secretion. Um, in fact, the last uh, part of its scientific name, plethanon glutinosis. Glutinosis is a Greek word for meaning uh, a lot of glue. So slimy salamanders, one of their ways they protect themselves is to release a lot of glue. Of course, the other way they protect themselves is a lot of these salamanders are toxic and their skin secretions are toxic. And that's to prevent predators from eating them. So it's always a good practice after you handle a salamander to wash your hands. Um, I'm anticipating we'll have several episodes on salamanders because remember, we're in the, uh, the salamander capital of the world. Well, the southern Appalachians have the greatest diversity of salamanders anywhere in the world. So we're definitely going to find some more as the year goes on. And I'm going to teach you how to identify more and more species of salamanders. Thanks for watching us today. Stay tuned for the next episode of Nature 